Okay, I think we'll start. It's the first day of spring. I'm looking for positive things here, okay? Uh, the weather's not too bad. Let's see, what else? Somebody help me. What's the positive? Somebody in the audience. Anybody get a good tan? What was this back here? Only a month and a half left of school. Now, are you graduating then? Yes. Okay. Okay, now let me tell you this. You're going to miss us. Yes, it happens all the time. Seniors graduate, and then you'll see them two years later, and they go, you know, I really miss that. I hate getting up 8 to 5 and doing all this. And uh, some will say, what do I have to do to get a master's degree? They want to get back that bad. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, you're going to miss this. Uh, anything else? Any other positive things? Uh, one positive thing is that we still have one team in the NCAA tournament, the men's, right? Basketball are still going. The women, I think, lost last night, right? Overtime? Overtime. Yeah, so they've been doing good. Um, so, yeah, too bad they're still not in it, but whatever. Uh, today, we're going, we're not having any student presentations, but i got to lead into this. Wednesday, or so tonight, uh, like maybe eight of you will get me an eight email from me, okay, saying you have to give something on Wednesday. And then later in the week, another eight of you will get an email from me to give some presentations Monday. So today it's me, but then Wednesday and Monday, it's going to be mostly you, and I'll show you when we get on the web here. Uh, the test a week from Wednesday, right? If I remember right, the test a week from Wednesday will go through photo period, including photo period. And I'll show you that right now since I'm talking about it. Just to make sure. Um, yeah, so here, this is it here, right? Yeah, it's on the screen. So I'm going to do, I don't know what, okay, so I'm going to do environmental hormones today. And then. Mon uh, Wednesday and Monday, we're going to do photo period, so the exam goes right through there, okay? Down through, including photo period. So photo period is things like the pineal gland, melatonin, things like that. Okay, so before I get there, though, I wanted to go to my blog and talk about a couple things. <clears throat> One is the Hoosier Horse Fair up here. It starts a week from Friday. It goes Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's something I always try to get down to, and I always remember it because it's the first, usually the first weekend in April, almost always. And it's uh, fun, even if you know if you're not familiar with horses, this is a great place to go. So I clicked, I made a click to their website where they have the, I guess you could say, schedule on Monday. Uh, the schedule for Friday, Saturday, Sunday is right up here. If you look at the, I think it's the program, then you can get a day by day blow. There it is, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Anyway, always fun. I'll have to tell you one thing that happened to me one time I was there. <clears throat> My wife and I were walking by the draft horses, and I love the draft horses. And this draft horse was in this pen, you know, and there's usually bars between them and you. And the horse looked me right in the eye. I swear to God, he looked me right in the eye, and he looked me in the eye, and then his big shoulder came over to the bars and pressed against it. What did he want? He wanted his shoulder scratched. And so I'm going over there scratching his shoulder, and my wife goes, aren't you gonna get into trouble touching those guys? Well, he asked me to do this. <laughs> I didn't volunteer. No, he looked me in the eye, and then he put his shoulder against the uh, pen, so yeah. Anyway, a lot of fun. Then, uh, a couple days ago, there were these food recalls. I wanted pet food recalls, and I want to show you that. <clears throat> Seems like we're always having pet food recalls now. So the seventh, what's the day, the 20th? So that was like three days ago. Some of you are familiar with this. Uh, contains beef thyroid hormone. Okay, well, so, what they're doing, and I don't know where they're getting all their ingredients, but obviously if you throw beef thyroid into the vat of whatever they're making, you're going to get, what, 
thyroxin, which is T4, and then T3 is triiodothyronine. Now, hopefully you guys are writing this down because remember we have a test and I need questions. Um, so, you know, the thyroid is famous for T3 and T4, but which one is the active hormone of those two? They're both not very, not, they're not equally active. Which one is the one that really is the active hormone? T3. T3 is the active hormone. So T4 and T3 are found in the blood, but it's T3 that really has the thyroxin effect. And of course, it increases metabolic rate, right? That's one of the big things about thyroid hormones. So some of these animals are like, you can read some of this stuff. Anyway, so they're, I don't know, when you're making dog food, these companies, it's always like behind the curtain, right? You don't know what they're putting in. It's kind of a you know pet peeve of mine, I guess. And then of course down here, pentobarbital. We talked about that. And some of you are confusing pentobarbital with phenobarbital. So pentobarbital is the basically the um, anesthetic uh, where you can you know, I used to use it when I castrated those large boars, right? I mean, not an anesthetic, but a, a sedative. And, you know, you give it IV, and I was using human-grade stuff. But the, this stuff, the pentobarbital, is coming from euthanized dogs and cats, right? You guys know that. Right? What's that? And horses, right? Well, yeah, horses, too, yeah. So these companies are getting these horses, dogs, and cats that have been euthanized with pentobarbital. Now when you inject a drug into an animal, there's always a half-life, right? But when you inject the drug into these animals, is that half-life valid? Tell me why it's not valid. They're dead. They're dead. The tissue's dead. See that? So it's kind of like you give a dose, but it doesn't disappear according to the published half-life because the published half-life is for living animals. When you euthanize these animals with an overdose of pentobarbital, a lot of that pentobarbital is going to sit there for a while. It's going to have a longer half-life because the cells are dead. It's not going to be chewed up by enzymes. So then you got these animals that have been euthanized, dogs, cats, and horses, and they're being put <coughs> into pet food. That's the only way that happens, right? There's no other explanation for it. It's, a, it's not something you find. In fact, not many people have pentobarbital. It's a controlled substance. I remember when I had it, I had to be inspected by the Drug Enforcement Agency, had to have a license, and I had to have a special place to lock it up where the combo was like five different numbers, not like three. It was like, it was, you had to really, it's a controlled substance. So this is crazy having dogs, cats, and horses that have been euthanized with this putting in the dog and cat food stuff. Anyway, so it's a grape of mine. I'm not so surprised about the thyroid hormone, but it's, uh, that's not good either. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to show you on that. Of course, we had uh, there's Precious Grace, and then I had a call in one of my other class there, and that was Sparky, yeah. Anyway, okay. So now, before I get to these two subjects, I wanted to talk about the last test uh, because there's something that might be on the next test, okay? Uh, and this, this reminds me, I bought the book. Remember I talked about it? And then I got to get on to those two questions on the uh, test. Uh, $200. So I would never have anybody buy this, but I would, right? Because I can buy it and then I can tell you what's in here. And it's not too bad. I happen to know the author a little bit when I used to be doing research. He was doing dairy research too. Um, and I'll have to look at it and see what it looks like. I might bring some stuff out for the thermal regulation. But what I really wanted to get to was this question. So there's two questions I'm going to go through from exam two. <clears throat> and I actually did a screenshot last night. And it's two that a lot, not a lot of people got wrong, but there was enough questions on the margin that made me say I better, I should talk about this. 
And again, it's another thing about um, how to look at those six choices and maybe get a lot of them out when they don't make sense. So blank has the ability to decrease blank influence on the heart. So let's go backwards. Calcium has the ability to increase hormonal influence on the heart. That makes no sense, don't think. Uh, decreased pack cell volume, that's decreased hematocrit, has the ability to decrease vagal influence on the heart. Nope, those are two different things. Now here's this word vagal, and I'm going to convince you, whenever you see that, think of the vagus nerve. And I've got some diagrams to show you this. So there is a, there is a vagal influence on the heart, but it has nothing to do with how many red blood cells you have in your blood. Then this is the same thing, but so that's totally wrong too. Those are two wrong. Now we're going to go to erythropoietin has the ability to decrease neural influence on the heart. Well, erythropoietin makes red blood cells in the bone marrow, promotes it, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the neural influence on the heart. Potassium has the ability to decrease hormonal influence on the heart. No, potassium can kill the heart, but it doesn't do it through hormonal means. So A is the right answer. Atropine has the ability to decrease vagal influence on the heart. Now remember, atropine is the acetylcholine antagonist, right? And so I want to show you some diagrams that show that the vagus does influence the heart, okay? So it's kind of like enough people got this wrong and it was messy that I want to get this cleared up. Okay, so here's a list of all the cranial nerves. These are nerves that come off the brain and go someplace. Usually they're all in the head, but not always. Like, and they're always numbered by Roman numeral. So cranial nerve number one is called the olfactory nerve. And it's a sensory nerve only. What does that mean? It feels something in the environment and all of the whole nerve is bringing material information to the brain. That's sensory, okay? So you can find out, and my, I'll never ask you all these nerves, but the thing is, some of the nerves bring things to the brain, and that's called sensory. Some only send messages out to move muscle, and those are called motor nerves. But there's some that are what's called mis mixed function, mixed. Some of the wires in the cable go carry messages out of the brain and some of the messages in the cable some of the wires in the cable take messages back up to the brain mixed function some of the nerve fibers are motor some are sensory and down here the vagus happens to be a mixed function nerve and it's amazing all the things it innervates most of these things are pretty simple they go someplace and it's rather simple. <clears throat> but the vagus is rather amazing. So whenever you see this thing, vagal influence, think of the vagus nerve, right? Cranial nerve 10. So then, let me get this. Uh, <clears throat> enlarged. And here's some schematic about the parasympath parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. You know, that's the two divisions of the autonomic, right? Well, lo and behold, maybe you don't know how why they're named, but the sympathetic comes off like this middle portion of the spinal cord, and then it innervates different organs. The parasympathetic, para means beside, and so the parasympathetic nervous system is beside the sympathetic. Here's some of it there, and there's some of it on this side. But look at the vagus, all the things it innervates. And one of them is the heart. And it says, slows heart rate. So what's the famous name for the sympathetic nervous system? It's the fight or flight system. And what it does, it gets you ready to fight or run. <clears throat> and here's another thing about the sympathetic. It's usually not on. Now, Robin's not here today, but I was going to use her. No, not Robin. Uh, Shannon. 
she T-boned a car the other day, and I was going to use her as an example of, I bet you her system, her sympathetic nervous system popped on because she said her heart was beating and all that stuff. <coughs> so the sympathetic isn't usually on. It's like you turn it on when something dramatic happens. The sympathetic, what's the name for it? If the sympathetic is fight or flight, the parasympathetic system goes by... What's that? Rest and digest. Rest and digest. And then there's another uh, another name for it too. Feed and breed. So by that, it has things to do with reproduction, digestion, and just kind of normal resting state. And here's the thing about the parasympathetic nervous system. It's always on a little bit. So I'm contrasting that with the sympathetic, which is either on or off. Sympathetic is always doing something a little bit. <clears throat> and so it's always slowing the heart rate down, the vagus. And it does that by releasing acetylcholine at the pacemakers. Okay, So the vagus nerve is releasing, it inner, innervates the heart, right? I can use that term. The vagus nerve innervates the heart, gives it a nervous supply, and it's releasing acetylcholine. And what if I want to stop the acetylcholine from influencing the pacemakers? What drug do I interject? inject? Atropine. No, atropine. Remember, atropine is the acetylcholine antagonist. So if you inject atropine into the animal, the heart rate goes up because you're counteracting the vagus influence. Okay, so let's quickly go back to that question. Atropine has the ability to decrease vagal influence on the heart, right? You inject atropine, it prevents acetylcholine from binding to its receptors at the pacemaker of the heart, and it has it to decrease the vagal influence. The heart rate goes up. Okay, then the other question. Well, I guess here's just another diagram to show that. It just shows you all the things the vagus nerve innervates again. It's, a, it's pretty amazing, okay? That's just kind of redundancy with the last one. Now the other question. I'm gonna pause this thing for a second. Okay, so here's the other question from exam two that I'd say not, you know, I don't know what, 10, 15% of the people got it wrong. It was enough that it got my attention. Signs of organophosphate poisoning are those of blank overstimulation. Well, remember, organophosphates kill acetylcholine esterase. And they let acetylcholine esterase, uh, let acetylcholine stay too long on the receptors. So let's go through the choices. Signs of organophosphate poisoning are those of renal overstimulation. I don't even know what that means. That's kidney overstimulation. Not sensible. Pituitary overstimulation, no. Cholinergic overstimulation, that's going to be the right answer. Hepatic overstimulation, hormonal overstimulation. I don't know, maybe somebody would have got sucked in with the, are those of hormonal overstimulation. That may, that's maybe the only other, other one that makes sense. So whenever you see this word cholinergic, that's really like getting interacting with acetylcholine. So I want to show you how the organophosphates then result in overstimulation of anything that uses acetylcholine. Okay, so here is a synapse that uses acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. And remember, I mean, you know, you guys know all these steps already, but the point is the organophosphates kill the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And when you have neural transmission, when you get a neural transmitter released, you either have to break it up right away or pump it away because you don't want nerve overstimulation. So degradation of the acetylcholine, sometimes the choline is recycled back, but this cholinergic overstimulation is because the insecticides kill acetylcholine esterase 
And so the blue acetylcholine stays longer in the receptors, okay? That was two long stories for those um, questions, but if you understand the principle, then next time you run into a question that's related to it, probably won't be the same exact question, you'll know it. Okay, now uh, that brings me up to my next topic there. So I'm going to talk about estrogen mimicking compounds. And this is obviously related to environmental physiology because there's compounds out in the water, out in the environment, that mimic hormones. Now when they're mimic, that means they act like it, but they're not the true hormone. And it seems like there's a lot of stuff out there that mimics the estrogens. And one step is whenever you have something that mimics a hormone, that means it binds to its receptor. It's got to be receptor hooking into the receptor, like the lock and key, the reading, we'll talk about a good hand in a glove, which is another way of doing that. So I'll just show you these two readings. I'm not going to, you know, you guys can read it, but I'm just going to point out some highlights. First of all, Tulane University has this great website called eHormone. And it's basically environmental hormones. And I happen to pick the stuff about estrogens, or in this case, this is talking about disruption. So here's a little tutorial on endocrine disruption. And that means you're disrupting what hormones, usually, <clears throat> how they usually work. So it goes on here, and it talks about hormone receptors. And <clears throat> some of the takeaway is for protein hormones, usually the receptor is on the cell membrane. It's facing outside the cell. So the protein hormones don't have to get into the cell to affect the cell. They bind to these membrane-bound receptors. Steroid hormones tend to have intracellular receptors. So they have to go through the membrane and bind to receptors that are intracellular, okay? And it ends up being the, horm the steroid hormones tend to make, have genes turned on, and their effects are longer term. If you have a hormone that binds to the exterior, you tend to get more rapid, immediate action, okay? So like estrogens tend to take hours or days to have their effect, okay? So like one famous thing is, if you give prepubertal mice, and I've done this when I taught repro labs, if you give them estrogen injections, prepubertal, they're not in puberty, and you have a control group where they get nothing or the oil supplement, and then you take out the uterus and weigh it, estrogen causes uterine growth, okay? It takes days to do this. Anybody know a hormone that would have an immediate effect on the uterus? that you inject it now, and seconds later the uterus reacts. What hormone would that be? Oxytocin, thank you. Causes uterine contractions. That's not gonna be any gene action there. It's gonna to bind to a receptor and immediately cause um, reaction. So this, this reading here that you go through talks about the different kinds of responses you get and one of the things one of the another take home message is that it's not as simple as one hormone one kind of receptor okay and you know the key thing is a good analogy the key is the hormone and let's say it only fit, fits that door but in this case some hormones fit more than one door there's enough wishy washiness in it that they're not like totally bound to one receptor and that's where some of this mimicking occurs. Some of the receptors bind these environmental compounds and get turned on like a regular hormone. So make sure you go, um, make sure you do that. And then wherever it says, click here to read more about hormone receptors, that's totally up to you. I wouldn't, I'm not gonna click there and make questions on whatever that leads to. Just whatever loads up. Okay, and then so it talks about hormone receptors inside, outside, endocrine disruption, and the point about endocrine disruption 
is where you have these environmental hormones or environmental compounds that act like hormones and they're going to bind to the receptors. Now here's what might happen when they bind to the receptors. It might activate what's called post-receptor events, but it might just bind to the receptor and do nothing, right? And in fact, that would act like an antagonist, right? A hormone antagonist binds to a receptor, but doesn't do anything after that, doesn't initiate anything after that. So some of these environmental hormones bind to the receptor. They don't do anything, but what they do is they block the native hormones from working. So it's very complicated. So when you're reading that, that's what comes out of that. Okay, so what else? Okay, there's, and there's references on that. Okay, I'm going to go to the next reading. <clears throat> okay, so now there's some wildlife effect, and it's quite long, but I'll show you what to skip, where it talks about, uh, you know, the general things, yes, we need to do long-term effects, yes, and then here's some things about um, the endocrine disruptors. And you should read that through this and get a an appreciation for almost any effect can be elicited by these hormones. Uh, abnormal blood levels of hormones, right? Uh, masculination of females, feminization of males, intersex. Intersex means that individual has sex organs of both sexes. That happens. And then all kinds of deformities, malformed, uh, embryo mortality, so these could be teratogens, right? Uh, skewed sex ratios, maybe all the offspring turn out to be female and there's no males, that's what that means. Reduced fertility, altered sexual behavior, modified immune systems, altered thyroid functions. I mean, it goes on, it's almost anything that can happen, right? <clears throat> okay, so then it talks about these altered states. But now down here, I guess you can skip the invertebrates. Because remember, this is a, about domestic animals. So you can skip from here. You can skip that. You can skip the fish. You can skip amphibians. You can skip reptiles. Not that it's not important, but it takes away from our main focus. But when it comes to birds, include the birds, right? Because we have poultry. We have turkeys. So start reading again where it says birds. And I did want to mention this too. Um, years ago, bald eagles, there was a decline in the population because they were, the females were laying soft shells. So they would lay eggs. It wasn't like they weren't laying eggs. But because of the soft shell, none of them developed and hatched. And it was because of DDT. And once they work this out, obviously that takes a while to work out. <clears throat> then they banned DDT and the eagle population, bald eagle population came up. Unfortunately though, it's still used in some countries. DDT is not banned worldwide. You know, every country decides what, what's good and what's not. So anyway, they had a decline in the population because of the DDT effect in the shells. And then, of course, there's mammals here. <clears throat> and then there's references. Now I get to go to my thing here. Okay, so then I want to talk a little bit about tamoxifen because this is actually an anti-estrogen. And... <clears throat> It ends up being how something, it's really, it's, it was mentioned someplace in that text, I, won't, I don't want to go back and find it, but it was talking about how um, this stuff can counteract the good effects of estrogen, or sometimes the bad effects of an, an estrogens. So tamoxifen is an anti-estrogen, it's known that, as that way, or you could call it an estrogen antagonist. And Here's a little diagram of what it does. It ends up being, now I'm not sure how prevalent this is, but in women, sometimes breast cancer is estrogen dependent. It's like 
estrogen causes the breast cancer. And tamoxifen is often used, sometimes I shouldn't say often, I'm not sure how prevalent this is, but it has been used to counteract the effects of the endogenous estrogen. And so it just points out that you can have estrogen bind to a certain receptor. This is the normal case. The, you know, there's something that happens with the receptor to do something post-receptor. You know, other things are activated. A lot of times gene action. And tamoxifen binds to the receptor, and that's how most of these um, antagonists work. In fact, probably all of them, if you name a compound and say antagonist, it has to bind to the receptor. But then it's not going to do any of the events normally like estrogen. It's, so it's kind of anti-estrogen. So it binds to the receptor, but it doesn't do any post-receptor events. Okay? Okay. I think I'm going to stop there today because I'm going to end with the estrogens there. Read your email tonight, because I'm going to email about eight, eight people for Wednesday.